My name is Adrian Basson. I'm the editor-in-chief of News24. And, and welcome, welcome to this morning's installment of Frontline to discuss Budget 2020 and particularly the implications for our state-owned enterprises. I'm joined this morning by Public Enterprises Minister Praveen Gordon, Ms. Mira Mula, Head of Investments at Investic Asset Management, still called that for a few days, I believe, and Kusatu's Parliamentary <laughs> Councillor Matthew Parks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me on the panel. Uh, this is a live broadcast of News 24 Frontline, and I would like to ask you, our viewers and readers, to participate to the conversation. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, at News24, and please send your questions and comments using the hashtag News24Frontline. I would like to start our discussion by reading from the foreword by Treasury Director General Dondo Mogajane to the budget review. He wrote, budgets are complex, but the numbers we face are straightforward. Without faster economic growth rates, South Africa cannot raise the revenue we need to fund our ambitious social and economic development agenda. Without sustainable public finances, revenue will increasingly be used to pay interest on debt, which now absorbs 15 cents of every rand government collects. Without financially self-sustaining state-owned companies, taxpayers will be paying for their losses for many years to come. He then continues in the budget review to outline National Treasury's plan for achieving faster economic growth, including the major announcement yesterday of a reduction of the public wage bill to the tune of 160 billion rand over three years. Minister Gordon, starting with you, and then I would like to give Nazmira and Matthew each a chance to respond. <coughs> Do you think the budget went far enough to provide some comfort to South Africans uh, for this very real and harsh future scenario sketched by Dondo Mogajane? Budgets reflect. Uh, oops. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, budgets reflect uh, economic and fiscal realities at any given point in time. Uh, we, we've been in similar situations before. When the first democratic government uh, took over, we didn't actually have any budget balance. We had a huge deficit uh, and a massive debt as well. In the late uh, or mid 90s, we went through a similar phenomenon. So you're going to get periods, of, I'm not the economist, the economist is on my right, I hope not politically. Uh, <laughs> but you're going to go through periods of a, a fiscal expansion and fiscal consolidation. Those are patterns that we're going to follow. So uh, the <coughs> Treasury and Minister Mboweni on behalf of government, remember they don't decide these things on their own. These are government uh, positions that, that they reflect, have done the best that they can, but there are as the minister pointed out, uh, better prospects ahead if we do the right things. Uh, if all of us, business, labor, government in particular, uh, agree that we need to invest more, get more confidence into the economy, get capital to actually come to the party, uh, we can have better growth in, in the next 18 to 24 months. Secondly, if we all are willing to make sacrifices of one kind or another, uh, depending on the constituency we're dealing with, then now's the time to do that so that you can sacrifice now and benefit later. And thirdly, uh, which we often forget, uh, as far as SOEs are concerned, we've got to uh, repair 10 years of damage. And uh, repairing distressed businesses, I'm sure you have some business people here, uh, doesn't happen overnight. It's a long, hard process. And uh, in some cases, you can say uh, the business will recover, uh, but the president said, I think, two years ago that many of these entities won't trade their way out of the difficulties that they find themselves in. And then we have to come up with innovative answers uh, to some of the problems that we confront. And coronavirus isn't going to make it any easier uh, as, as we go forward. Because as we heard, I think, last night, there are more uh, instances of infection outside of China now than within China itself. So what does it mean? Which wave is going in which direction? How will it impact on economies and confidence? Still remains uh, something that you will change every 24 hours as we go on. Before we go to coronavirus, Nazmira Mullah, let's, let's stick to the budget from yesterday. Did, did the minister go far enough to give some comfort? Do you feel more comfortable this morning? I feel more comfortable that we're dealing with the big issue that needs to be dealt with. 
in that we've, we've seen in the medium-term budget policy statements for some time a discussion on the deterioration in the composition of spending in the budget, the fact that wages were consuming just far too much off the budget. I mean, there are great stats from various provinces where the education department in some provinces seeing 60, 70 percent of their budget going into wages, which leaves very little for textbooks, infrastructure, and anything else. And on this other side, you have had no commensurate increase in service delivery. So we have to deal with this. Um, the question for me, which I'm sure the gentleman to my left is going to bring up shortly. He's left uh, politically he, as well. He's left politically <laughs> as well. I, I, I suspect I'm probably to the right of the minister but, um, economically, <laughs> if I have to guess. Um, that perhaps the communication between government and labor around this could have been um, better. And we saw the Minister of Finance use the rugby analogy, um, the strength of the Springboks um, lost very dramatically to New Zealand two years earlier, only to win. And, and I think if you have ever had the privilege of listening to Rusty Erasmus talk about that period, um, what he talks about is that absolute focus and single-mindedness. <coughs> and they had an agreed plan, they kept to the plan, they focused on the plan over that period, and that's what South Africa needs to do now. We need to agree a plan between government, business, labor, and focus on the plan. And unfortunately, it feels like the next couple of months are gonna be fighting about what the plan is. Matthew Pox, uh, I have to agree with Nazmira. If I listened to you and your colleagues speaking yesterday uh, afternoon, you were working, using phrases like declaration of war, <laughs> extreme provocation. Um, why, why are you so upset? Look, I think maybe to start from the beginning, we agree that we're in a crisis, the worst economic crisis in, since 94. Government has been hollowed out because of state capture and corruption. Our SUEs are collapsing. And look, as Kosato, we want to save the state. Our members depend upon it, not just for the jobs and pensions, but also for the public services the state renders to society. I um, mean, we agree that you know, complaining and lamenting is not a way to keep the lights on or to save the state and the economy. We have to come with contributions. I think that Nazmira is, is right to say that some of these things could be handled better in terms of the engagement. Um, what really kind of provoked our members is that this kind of slipping under the door at the Public Service Bargaining Council Tuesday afternoon, a note from government saying we want to withdraw from this year's wage agreement. We've been having actually quite good talks about talks between ourselves and government, maybe not fast enough but how do we find each other on the wage issues? Um, but look, we still have to engage with each other. We don't have a choice. We're in this ship together. We must find each other. We do have proposals on how we think the wage issues can be addressed, from pu putting the public sector entities under the Public Service Bargaining Council, so we have one process, reducing the fat on top, what ministers, premiers, mayors, management earns, about which posts you need to fill, which ones can we leave aside. We think there are ways, if we're smart about it, we can, we can address it in a win-win solution. And we don't have a, a choice. We're, we're in a huge crisis. We have to save the state. We have to find each other. Um, at times, we could do things a bit better. And we look, we, we met, after the October medium-term budget statement, we were quite alarmed as Kosatu. We didn't feel there was a plan from government to save the ship. But also, we don't have the luxury of time. We saw how rapidly things were deteriorating at SAA. We couldn't afford to just sit back. And we, so we went to the alliance leadership. Early November, we proposed a raft of compromises from our side as COSATO about how we think we can save not just ESCOM, but the SOEs, the state, the fiscus, the economy. And we've been a bit disappointed that Lutulias hasn't taken up the off of offers from our side to have those meaningful engagements. And that's why we then had to, in January, basically deal with ministers who we think are serious about engagement, like, like Minister Gordon, to see how do we get things moving, um, because you don't have the luxury of time to simply sit back any longer. Matthew, can I ask you just to elaborate for us on this, because this is very important. It was definitely the big story from the budget. Uh, the number of 150, 160 billion rand, was yesterday the first time that Labour has heard about this? No, look, government's been talking about 150 billion rand for, for a time. I think the, what shifted significantly was the kind of formal withdrawal from the existing agreement for this financial year. Um, we've been having talks for the, about the next three-year cycle, and we've been looking at ways to, to meet that 150 billion rand um, from what's the increase level, the, the attrition level, redeployments, cutting on the top, the public sector entities. But I think, look, it's, it's also not easy for COSATO as well, because they have 16 different unions which have their own challenges. What the challenges facing teachers are very different than those facing Nahau, etc. And also, it's a, it's a diverse coalition, if I can put it that way. And it's also not, not just us, but we have to also deal with other unions, like the Public Service Association, which have a very different, different political vantage point than us. 
But look, besides the complaints and, and the, the hurt feelings and anger, we still have to find each other and we need to do it quickly um, because we can't afford to allow the ship to go under. That's why we had gone to the ANC in November and said, can we achieve a social compact, not just on ESCOM, but the entire raft of issues, the wage bill included. We'd wanted actually to have that in place by the budget speech yesterday so that we could present to South Africa a social compact between government, labor, and business that we're all going to contribute, to compromise, to sacrifice. And even to send a message to the investors locally and foreign that we are now taking responsibility for our crises, we're going to save it as South Africans and not just wait for, for miracles to happen any longer. Minister Gordon, you are a supporter of the social compact style and, and, and these talks. Do you think yesterday's announcement and, and the impact this may have on the unions could jeopardize that process, specifically with regards to the ESCOM debt deal? No, not necessarily. You'll always have uh, different stakeholders taking, <coughs> excuse me, slightly different um, approaches depending on their vantage point, depending on what their constituencies think is important. Uh, and it's interesting, Matthew uses the terminology talks about talks. So if you remember 1990, we had lots of talks about talks. The Kurdiskia Agreement, the DF Milan Agreement, it sounds strange to even say it in today's terms, DF Milan, but anyway. Um, so we're going to get that kind of, uh, let's call it positional play. At the end of the day, I think all three of us would agree, we uh, in difficulty, number one. Number two, we need to get out of that difficulty. Number three, we have a choice. Either we try to do things on our own and point fingers or find a common platform, which is what Labour has been trying to do with, uh, with government uh, and with business as well. And I, I think Nasmira in introduces an important point. As South Africans, we've got to start changing the culture with which we do things. A greater sense of focus, uh, common commitment, and uh, making sure that we become results oriented and stop being lazy about things. Uh, if we do that, I think there's, there's still bright prospects ahead of us. I do want to stay with the issue of the public uh, wage bill uh, because I think that is the elephant in the room. And I think, you know, when you look at, for example, Kusatu's suggestions for a ESCOM debt deal, it includes a condition that no jobs are lost at ESCOM. I mean, is that realistically something that could be done. We know in ESCOM, I think there's something like 800 managers who earn, earn over 2 million rand. You know, is it possible to do, make these deep cuts, uh, have this plan, the social pact, and not touch any jobs? No, I, I, I think as you get into the nitty gritty, you'll find that there's ways of accommodating each other. The private sector does very similar things. Some just slash and burn. Others have come across who have large numbers of uh, workers to deal with but have found innovative, creative, and supportive ways of dealing with their workforce. So this idea that uh, you, know, you just get up American style, slash 10,000 workers, put them out into the street without any social security net or alternatives is not one that will work here. Uh, but we have mechanisms and experiences in South Africa which if we pool can be used both in the private sector and in the public sector as well. So right now we're researching what those uh, mechanisms could be, how, for example, different <coughs> schemes under the UIF could be utilized to soften uh, the blows that uh, workers or managers might actually confront. At the same time, uh, when you're in difficulty, then those, all these ratios go wrong, whether it's debt GDP, deficits, mm -hmm. the wage bill in relation to the total expenditure, change the denominator and everything else will, uh, will, will look slightly better. But we will still come back to the question, uh, of productivity within the public <coughs> sector. For the people we employ, uh, the salaries that we pay, are we getting the best out of them? And I don't think so. Do you agree with that, Matthew? No, look, I think we'd agree. And I think we've been quite pleased when, as Kusato to hear Minister Godan speaking quite early about the need to save jobs. Um, and look, when a 40% unemployment rate, we're not going to resolve our economic crisis by throwing people into the unemployment queue. Um, and look, we had intervened specifically on ESCOM because said, let's rather do it now whilst we have time to deal with issues. On the headcount ESCOM, we have specifically proposed to avoid retrenchments. Let's look at a skills audit, a headcount audit, to know exactly what's happening at ESCOM. And we we're quite pleased when Minister Gordon has said, look, if there's a surplus of staff in generation, we can look at redeployment to where there's a, a shortage of staff in transmission or distribution, or even to municipal electricity departments where there is a skills shortage. 
We've gone further to say, look, if there are about 122 to 77,000 vacancies in the public service at any point in time. We can look at redeployment even, even there to key frontline service areas. But look, we also need a forensic audit of what's gone in ESCOM because the looting there is industrial scaling, scale. And we, we're quite pleased the new CEO has said we need to do lifestyle audits of everybody. They need to go further. They need to have forensic audits. They need to implement those forensic audit reports. They need to look specifically at supply chain. But also the private sector must also contribute. So the overpricing of the coal suppliers, the IPP generators must be dealt with. The maintenance contractors who are basically looted must come to the party. So we must all make a contribution and all make a sacrifice. That way we can, can, we can save things. Ms. Mira, this is a difficult balance that government finds itself in because we have that outrageous unemployment number and government doesn't want to and cannot be seen to be contributing to that number. But at the same time, how do you save or cut back or reduce the wage bill by 160 billion over three years without retrenching? Let's use that word, let's put it out there, firing people. I think the Treasury plan, as it's currently envisaged in the numbers, I mean, they, they don't tell you how to save the money, they tell you how much money needs to be saved. But in that, let's be clear on something, that they're not looking at cutting wages. They're looking at growing it slower than it was forecast to grow. So what they're looking at is something that looks like a very small 1.5% increase in the current year as opposed to the 7% that was expected. And that is not unheard of in a company in distress. If the South African government was a company, it would have had wage freezes about three years ago. So if our imperative is to save jobs, wage freezes are a no-brainer. If we're insisting on wage increases, then the corollary is at some point in time we will have to cut jobs. I would prefer not to cut jobs because I agree with you. I think there is, the South African economy can, cannot shoulder further job losses at this point in time, so we need to do everything possible to minimize that. But that means job, wages need to grow less. That's how that trade-off works. I understand that the political economy of doing that for Mr. Parks is almost impossible, because trying to explain to his members earning, teacher earning 400,000 rands, why that is necessary is really difficult in this environment. But if we look at it from a macroeconomic perspective, <coughs> that's, where, that's the only possible option. Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> now, like Nazimir understands how difficult it is at times, because um, our own members are quite despondent and angry. They accuse us often as Kosato of being soft on government, um, we're better the ANC, so we're, we're bailing out the ANC, etc. But look, we've had many compromises over the years. Um, some of our unions are willing to make significant compromises. In fact, this year's wage agreement is actually the lowest in, in about 10 years. But we're willing to have the discussions, and we think there is space to find each other. But there are also certain principles we can't agree with, like we can't agree to retrench workers, no union can agree to that. We can't agree to a worker's salary is being slashed, or not to getting inflation increases, etc. But I think we can find each other, we have to find each other. Um, but also, it will be much easier for us to sell any compromises to a, a nurse or a teacher if we can see the politicians mm -hmm. sacrificing. So we appreciate the president made a, a wage freeze for the executive. We actually would want to go further than that. We would actually want to see a 10% salary cut for the executive, but also we would want to see a cap on what management can earn in the public sector entities. In fact, there, the salary should actually be slashed because it's, it's impossible to tell a nurse earning 20,000 rand, tighten your small little belt, when you have the 800 managers in ESCOM earning above 2 million rand. And those are the guys who have broken ESCOM and who are now having to basically save and spend our money to do it. But look, we think a crisis can be a good thing. We can resolve many issues one time, if we can find each other, we have to do it. Um, there's also a unique window opportunity that we now have a president who's serious about cleaning up the state. We have ministers who are committed to doing that. And this is a huge change than two years ago when you had basically hooligans running amok in the state, looting it to the point of collapse. So it's a tough challenge, but we can find each other, we have to find each other. Matthew, can I just challenge you a bit on that? So state capture wasn't done by five or ten guys, it was done by a system and I think we haven't properly unpacked the deep layers of capture in an entity like ESCOM um, and, other, and other government entities, but some of those are also your members. Sure. I mean, have, as Kusatu <coughs> and the unions in themselves had these hard discussions. No, look, and there's no law which says because you're wearing a Kusatu t-shirt you're not immune, you're immune from the law. So that's why we're, we're pleased with the new ESCOM CEO saying he's going to do a lifestyle audit of all ESCOM employees. Um, the, the looting, everybody, no one is untouched by it, whether you're in a, a union, a party, or a church, or even a media house. 
Everybody's been affected by this, by this corruption. So not, not to point fingers. Um, new age. <laughs> We're in a new age, as I said. <laughs> and many more. <laughs> um, so look, everybody must be subject to it. We can't, for example, say as workers who want to invest the PIC funds, workers' investment funds in ESCOM, if we're going to continue to allow the looting to take place. So you have to do it. We actually hope the NPA will now finally come to the party and start throwing people in prison. There's been, I think, two rounds of arrests at ESCOM and court appearances. Yeah. That's a good start. But when you have reports of about 2,000 officials at ESCOM and having tenders, it shows you how deep the looting is. So we need to see that happening. We need to see some blood on the floor, to be honest, to give a sense of hope to our members, to, to the public, that governors are beginning to turn the tide around this, this industrial looting. We heard yesterday 2.4 billion rand more given to the NPA um, and specifically the investigative directorate of Advocate Kron here. So let's see if that will spur it. Nasmira, you wanted to come in on that? Well, I think just to support this point, I think it's really important that you start to um, deal with the corruption because w w what that will do is it will make future contracting more honest. Because we have a lot of private sector companies, and the private sector needs to own responsibility for this, where they have, in large companies with large brand names, local and global, have paid people inside these state-owned companies or inside <coughs> government in order to get a more favorable contract, to offer a substandard service, um, and that needs to be flushed out of the system. And the best way to do that, that to ensure that government gets value for money, is by putting people in jail. I, I, every time before a budget speech or a sonar address, I, th I think that the politicians are praying for some arrests, you know, that will just make their lives easier. There was a, it was a thick rumor during the rounds before sonar about a very prominent arrest that kind of lifted the collective mood, but it didn't happen. So we'll obviously uh, watch that space. Uh, Nasmira, I want us to, to turn to, to the ESCOM debt package and specifically <coughs> the P word, pensions. Uh, Minister Tito Mbeweni in the budget speech said very little uh, about the ESCOM debt package, and we know there's still negotiations going on behind the scenes of the social pact, you know, this compact, this plan of business and labor and government coming up with a, with a solution for ESCOM, because as we all know, ESCOM um, can take us all down. Um, but Minister Mboweni yesterday in the press conference before his speech uh, suggested that not only public workers' pensions should be used, uh, but also private pension funds. Um, do you think this is a step towards prescribed assets to finance ESCOM's debt? Uh, and as an investor of private sector pensions, how eager are you to invest your clients' money in ESCOM bonds? It's a lot of questions happening there. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so let's start off with the, with the proposed <coughs> package. So I think the, f the first thing for me is I'd, I, I think it's excellent that we have all the um, uh, stakeholders involved in this process. The fact that Casatio has tabled a plan, is trying to resolve this, I think is really important. It brings us to that point where we can collectively come up with something. That's the first thing. The second thing is I strongly believe that Eskom's issues are not just financial and the financial issues are not the biggest problem. There are operational issues, there are the corruption issues that we talk about, and without an operational plan for Eskom, a financial plan is a temporary band-aid. <coughs> Because if we just lift the debt off Eskom and leave it operating as it is, we'll just be in exactly the same position in five years' time. So we cannot have, uh, it's the worst possible option for me, is to do a debt restructure without sorting out the operations. So I, I think we need to think about sequencing here very carefully. To then get to your, the point of your question, which is prescribed assets. Um, I think that using, um, PIC money converting debt into equity if there's a sound operational plan may perhaps make sense. I'm, I'm not one of those people that says this is a really bad idea. I think if it's done in a responsible manner, um, given that this is a defined benefit fund, given that you can make the argument that the entire value of the rest of the savings pot could be enhanced by this, it, it, it is possible to do, but it is contingent upon an operational plan at Eskom being in place and being achieved before it's possible. If we then translate this into private sector funds, which are defined contribution, it gets more tricky. Because in the PIC's case, the GEPF has the government and us as taxpayers standing behind if there is a shortfall. In a defined contribution fund where members are only entitled to whatever they've contributed, it starts to become more tricky. So then you get to a concept called impact investing. 
which is something that I think all asset managers, including ourselves, are very much on board with. This idea that you can use long-term contractual savings to make investments in the economy that raise potential growth and give members adequate returns. But that second part is really important, which means you need governance, <coughs> which means you need profitability, and you need um, the entity that you're investing in to be run in a manner that that makes sense. If, if that can be found, and there are many examples of that, so we, we have um, credit funds that invest in infrastructure projects across um, Africa, African credit opportunities, um, it's, it's possible to do, to, to find that balance. But I, I am personally very averse to prescribed assets because that allows um, pension funds to be dictated to, to invest in specific things that may have no financial return that's viable. Minister? No, I just wanted to say that one of the effects of uh, state capture uh, is not just about boards and CEOs and the management teams. The core impact is on, on the operations of these entities. And if those operations are not repaired, and I'm just looking at cranes out there <laughs> uh, at the moment, so whether it's Transnet, Eskom, SAA, whatever, all of them have damaged operations because the focus was on stealing. It wasn't on making the entities as efficient as they could be. Have efficient, well-run uh, operations, you'll make money. If you make money in the right kind of way and at the right tariffs, you don't have to be dependent on the fiscus in any kind of way. So more and more we need to focus on operational efficiency, getting the right people there and skilling the people that are in those jobs at the moment and demanding that managers in these entities actually perform much better uh, than they've done up to this point in time. On, on uh, the question of pension funds and so on, I'm sure that if we put all the talent that we have in this country across government, labor, and business, we'll come up with formulae that will enable us to move away from the bogey woman of prescribed assets. So we, we, we look for the bogey man or the bogey woman rather than the substance. And the substance here is how do you use national resources in a uh, responsible way, meaning getting a fair return on your investment so that uh, you can solve many problems at the same time. So focus on A, the problem, B, the solution, not the bogey factor, which often distracts uh, from meaningful debate and creative answers beginning to actually emerge. And uh, I suppose in the world of fake news and all of that stuff, so I, I don't know if you caught what Pope Francis said yesterday, all Catholics must stop trolling. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting idea because it actually responds to some of the things that are going on in, in society today. Uh, but we can find answers, but uh, it's not about prescribed assets versus something else and so on. The slogans here don't, won't take us any further. It, it's okay if you're on a platform. You, you've got to, we've got to get down to the basics of actually uh, if you like, saving each of these entities, putting them on the right kind of footing, and anybody who's taken a broken business and tried to repair it will know this is hard work at the end of the day. But I think we have the will and the resources in this country. But Minister, with all respect, you have to have some sympathy for a teacher or a nurse who's hearing that their pension funds may now be used to bail out an entity like ESCOM that's been looted for many years, that had overpaid managers. Uh, why, why must they pay for it? That sentiment isn't I'm something... I'm not saying whose pension fund you should yeah. be used, otherwise they'll all run out of the door just now. <laughs> uh, all, I'm, all I'm saying is who takes responsibility for the looting? These are state entities. So the, you are, as a citizen, in fact, the owner of these entities. So you have a choice. You either repair them, or let them collapse. And if they collapse, you're gonna lose huge value on the one hand, but important uh, network industries like energy, for example, which the economy can le least afford at this point in time. So whose responsibility is it at the end of the day? If we, and, and we're not saying whose pension money must be used, that's a different issue. And pension money is just one dimension of the ultimate solution that we're looking for. Uh, these things will have to start operating, and over a 10-year period, you'll have to get them right. Matthew, this is your plan, so let me turn the spotlight <laughs> to you. So maybe firstly, just shortly, how did this plan come up of, of, of pension funds, of the GPF specifically? And then secondly, Nazmira made a very <coughs> compelling argument that you have to fix operations first. Do you agree that cutting up ESCOM in three with the own boards, own executives, etc., is that the right way to go to get the operational part fixed before we talk about the debt package? Sure. 
Look, I think for us, uh, the salient moment was the October medium term budget statement. We really felt that we're heading for a precipice. If we continue this route, ESCOM will die, and it will take all of us with it. I mean, look, we may not love ESCOM, you may hate it, it's fine, but the fact is it generates 95% of our electricity and it transmits and distributes 100%. So even if you were to privatize it, well, no one would buy a, a company with debt for 54 billion rand. Even if you open up the doors completely to private generation, it'll take a decade plus to catch up to where ESCOM is. So you have to fix it. And we've seen that now with load shedding, we're losing about 2 billion rand every day in the economy because of it. Um, We've looked at it that it's not just our, the 44,000 jobs at ESCOM which are at stake, it's all 60 million jobs which depend upon ESCOM survival. It's also all our pension funds which depend upon ESCOM surviving, the stock market surviving, the economy growing. You might remember that um, Comrade PG's predecessor, one chap called Nklantla Nene, he was fired one, at one o'clock in the morning, one, one December night, for some strange reason. That next day we lost about 500 billion rand on the stock market. That was pension money. So we have, <laughs> he remembers. Um, About 10 p.m., wasn't it? <clears throat> and that our pension money was just wiped off. The entire year's pension funds were just devastated. So we have a choice. Either we continue to sleep on the job and we allow ESCOM to go under, or somehow we think government on its own can save it, or we all contribute to South Africans. Labour, government, business, we all make a sacrifice, compromises, to save a most critical national company. And we think the time is now. You can do it now, or you can wait for a year and go to the IMF, and the IMF will impose brutal austerity measures like they did to Greece or Ireland, which will devastate the economy and public services. And we have the resources. So we've looked at not a bailout, not a blank check, but conditional investments. And not just the PIC, but all of us must contribute. Government through the Development Bank, the IDC, the CETAS, the private sector, all of us must com contribute. It can be done. The PIC already has 104 billion rand invested in ESCOM through bonds, guaranteed bonds, which ESCOM has been paying. We're looking at a combination, for example, from the PIC, of the bonds, but also perhaps for looking at equity investment in, in the ESCOM. Because we want to have the PIC having a stake in ESCOM where they have a seat on the board, where they can force ESCOM to restructure, to clean up, to deal with the corruption, the wasteful expenditure. So it's not a blank check, there's, there's about 30 conditions, and I think Comrade PG knows every time we meet, is we've added more conditions. Um, but I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity that we don't just deal with the short-term crisis, but we look at medium and long-term interventions. How we can invest in renewable energy, um, build a local solar panel manufacturing industry, convert our cars from diesel and gas to electric. There's a massive opportunity, and we could exploit it to create new jobs. But we have to deal with it. You can't simply ignore it and hope somehow a miracle will happen and it won't be dealt with. Um, and there are many, we've actually been quite pleasantly surprised, Adrian, that while some of us, some people have demonized us and say we're, we're smoking drugs, we're crazy. Um, but actually, we've received very fantastic responses from business, from pension fund administrators, from banks, who said, actually, we're willing to contribute ideas. Even as Mira, she came with some useful ideas Even yesterday. Even as Mira. <laughs> in, between, in, between, in between clapping me yesterday. Far right. <laughs> from the extreme far right. She said, actually, there are some ways you can do it in this and this and this, which yeah. are useful. So we're quite pleased that we're having a national debate. We're all accepting we must contribute. Everybody's accepting the social compact between government, business, and labor. Even with, with business, we had this long fight about prescribed assets. We thought that would take us a decade of trench warfare to come to consensus. We're actually quite shocked. In a very short space of time, Busa business have said, no, we can contribute. As long as it meets the fiduciary duties, the financial integrity, the investment and pension fund man, uh, mandates, which we agree with 200%, we can find each other. And that, it can open a whole new conversation. You know, for example, on, on, on roads, we have a backlog, I think, of about 600 billion rand around road investments. We could actually start assisting government in useful economic investments you know, around, around the ports, the rail infrastructure, water infrastructure. So it could be a fantastic opportunity actually to clean up our act as a nation and, and do it. Um, we don't have a choice, alternative, you know? Um, some guys are moaning and groaning, but even when you engage with them, like Solidarity and PSA, they actually were starting to find each other and we can do it. And it's, a, it's quite amazing. We've had this discussion basically since January and we think we're about 90% there to getting an agreement. It took us about two and a half years to find an agreement on the minimum wage. But here, in basically, about two or three months, we think we will find each other, and it can be a huge opportunity to change things for the better. And you're still uh, happy to lead that discussion even after yesterday's announcement? We have to, and uh, we're actually quite, my colleagues are, are quite pleased when people insult us and say, oh, okay, at least people are listening to Cosato. So those who said Cosato is dead, it's irrelevant, well, they still feel the need to insult us, so it's fine, but we are finding each other.
<laughs> National interest. It all sounds, feels very 94-ish right here on the stage at the moment, Nazmir and Willa. Um, Matthew Park says it's basically the IMF or the pensions. Uh, do you agree with that? I don't think he said quite that. <laughs> <laughs> I have I to summarize. <laughs> I think you're making it extreme there. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think w w what he's saying, which is really important, is that if we don't make decisions now, it will be the IMF at some stage in the future. If we don't come together as a country and find common solutions, um, then it will need to be externally imposed at some point in time, and, and, and that's the least preferable option. So I, I, I completely ag agree with him on that point. Do you think, do you see, I mean, you look at the economy every day, that's your job, do you see any other suggestion or plan that excludes pension funds being used to bail out ESCOM's debt that's feasible, that, 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 that we haven't spoken about, that nobody's brought to the table? I think there are ways to do it. You, you're going to need some funding support in, in various forms, but there are, there are things that are possible. So, so what, one of the global, um, I, don't want to even, I don't want to use the word trend, imperative right now is the shift to sustainability. I saw a graph yesterday um, in the FT about the amount of coal that US power stations are consuming and it has halved in the course of the last four years. In four years, it's, it's been cut in half and, and the line is plunging further downward. So South Africa has this opportunity to use this trend in our favor. There are green funds available globally. If, if we push this shift away from coal in these old coal-powered um, coal stations that need to be shut anyway, we can access some of that global funding that, that's available. Um, and I think the listening to um, Matthew and um, the minister, I mean, I think one of the things that strikes me is the solution ultimately is in 10 years' time, we need to have a far lower proportion of our generation capacity coming from Eskom. We cannot have this dependency. That is the way we reach sustainability, and therefore we need to see much more private sector involvement. Government needs to set up the playing field, ensure that it's fair, but let the private sector build, and that's how you get the pension fund money into infrastructure in South Africa in a way that doesn't compromise the pensions as well. I want to stick, uh, stay on the SIEs, Nazmira, and yesterday we heard 60 billion rand of reallocations. Uh, are set aside to fund ESCOM and SAA, um, what's left of SAA. Uh, the government has now had to literally put, had to cut from departments <coughs> like education and health to start bailing out the, uh, these SAEs. Do you think there's still a case to, to be made to hang on to non-essential SAEs? So we've spoken about ESCOM, we agree that ESCOM is it's ESCOM or bust, but other SAEs, other non-essential SAEs, and then specifically SAA, I mean, shouldn't we just sell it? Are you, do you have a buyer for SA? <laughs> <laughs> do you have a client? <laughs> Let's have an auction. Let's have an auction. <laughs> How much do we need to be paid to take SA? Um, <laughs> sorry, Minister, I, I apologize. Um, well, there's still at least six, is it 16 billion so that was allocated. Yeah. Um, okay. So I personally think that government should get out of every area that it is not required to be in. There are some areas where there is a public good that, need, that, that you need government involvement. Um, and I think electricity provision and, and certainly um, ownership of the transmission lines is one of those areas. That makes sense for the government to own that on a long-term basis. Um, but every other area that is not necessary, um, I mean, running portions of the ports um, much more efficiently done if you, if you start to introduce competition into that space. You need to introduce accountability. <coughs> there, there's, I'm going to divert, but I will bear with me. Um, so there's, there's a woman who works for me who grew up in the Eastern Cape, and she tells a great story. She says she went to a high school which was privately owned but had no facilities, had exactly the same as the public schools around her, and it had much better metric outcomes, and the only difference was the fact that teachers could be fired by the principal. That accountability which someone actually running a port concession introduces, as opposed to this beer myth which knows it can go back to the state if it loses money, is completely different. The incentive structure is completely different, and that's what we need to understand in South Africa. We need to change the incentive structures because as much as public um, sector ownership allows for social imperatives, 
it doesn't work if the capacity of the state is, is not there. And South Africa does not have enough capacity in its state to achieve these imperatives. So, so yeah. if I can just respond, if you look at the Eskom roadmap paper uh, on the generation side, we're saying that create three or so separate entities and the uh, buying office, so to speak, still to be created, uh, will then take the cheapest electricity available from one of the three generators. Models that are used elsewhere as well. And the key principle there is, in fact, the competition one. The competition doesn't only have to come from the private sector. The state itself also needs to push itself. And we've said uh, that we are quite critical of the monopoly culture in these big enterprises where there's a lack of transparency, data is hard to get hold of, uh, price structures just keep <coughs> increasing, uh, costs keep increasing, uh, because of the moral hazard uh, problem, which is that we can always go back to Mother or Father Christmas because there will always be a bailout available. And, and the direction we want to go in is each of these entities must be self-sufficient, make enough money from their own operations and keep themselves going uh, as, as the first principle. But the second, the culture needs to change. This culture, whether it's a private sector monopoly or a public sector monopoly, well, here's the economist. She'll tell you, the, the culture is the same. You have dominance, you can set prices, you can uh, hold uh, uh, customers hostage in one form or another. And that's a problem with our economy as a whole. It's mm -hmm. over-concentrated. Uh, but that's another, another issue for another day. But in the public sector, it's possible to get competition going, get the incentive structures right, and get much higher levels of productivity uh, and efficiency as well. Minister, can we just return to SIA for a moment? So the business I was trying to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the, the business rescue practitioners, uh, they, their plans are, are due in the next few days or, or weeks. Um, 16.4 billion rand reallocated to SIA. Um, it must have been very hard for, for the government of which you're part to take money from projects like health and, and education to, to put it into an airline that's, that's clearly on its last legs. No, no, it's always difficult, but much of that 16 billion is debt, that about 11.2 is debt that SAA owes. And what the budget is saying is that it's time to repay that debt and uh, minimize the interest cost of, of that debt as well. So that's number one. Number two, the business rescue, I mean, any business rescue process is about ensuring that the outcome is a sustainable business, otherwise liquidate. Why, why go into business rescue? Um, the third is that Money is uh, uh, being taken across the board, that's true. But we must not mistake that for austerity, Greek style, right? Where we've cut people's pensions, we are uh, cutting daily services, we know any of that at this point in time. Whether it's the British model or the Greek model or any other model. Uh, and that is why the compacting is important, that is why uh, national interest is important, that is why the different constituencies need to realize before you cross over the precipice, as Matthew was saying, we have an opportunity to do things differently. Are we willing to do it? And, and that's the real test of leadership from across the board, not just government. I want to bring up another bogey woman, if you would uh, excuse me. Would you, whatever the business rescue practitioners say should be done, will you go with that? It's their plan. We have no authority. But as a stakeholder and as uh, somewhat of a creditor, remember the state is providing the post-commencement finance at the moment. So we have a, we have a view, uh, but obviously we'll be stupid to put forward a view which results in another collapse. Uh, so we engage like they engage other constituencies as well. Uh, and let's see what we get out of it. We've asked you, our readers and, and the panel and, and people in the audience today, to send us questions. Um, so I want to move to those questions now. Um, we have a question here from uh, Rob Tiffin, and, and his question is, I've seen a lot of companies in my sector having to lay off hard-working members, and in some cases closing because of load shedding and the high electricity prices. Yet I see 16,000 workers who were employed under the state capture years not because they were needed or had the skills ESCOM wanted, but were employed for political reasons. Those workers cost ESCOM 13 billion rand a year and add an additional economic burden onto every customer of ESCOM at approximately seven cents per kilowatt. Uh, you claim to be a man of fairness, Minister Gordon. Is it fair that my hardworking workers can lose their jobs as thousands of others have already in our poor economy, but 
there are 16,000 untouchable workers who, who don't work, uh, who, who don't work, who's, who's being kept there. How is that fair? Yeah, well, firstly, our, our economy does require energy security, so let's all agree on that. Secondly, as we say, the reality is 95% of uh, electricity is being generated by ESKIM, so that's a reality as well. The third is that government is saying ESKIM can't remain as it is, and the ESKIM roadmap paper, the restructuring into three entities, uh, are all meeting the, time, the times of the day, so to speak, because there's an energy transition, there's a utility transition, uh, and if you like, there's a structural transition in terms of microgrids and all sorts of things that are actually happening. And we have to respond to that in some way. And Minister Mantash uh, and the Department of Energy is beginning to lay the groundwork uh, for that, as is the IRP itself. So it's, un it's completely unfair, uh, or it, not the right thing, that uh, workers in, the, in, in, in industry have to face the consequences of tariffs. Yet others will say that our tariffs are not as high as we think they are in terms of global comparison. And yet others will say that maybe some of our businesses, and this doesn't apply in this case necessarily, haven't invested sufficiently in energy efficient technology. So we've all got to look at the mirror, so to speak, and say how do we change the way we're doing things and how do we protect uh, workers in that kind of context on the one hand and, but also have a smooth transition uh, and reduce the cost structure of ESCOM, which we've said it very explicitly, we actually need to do. I've got a question here from Kashifa Basadin, News 24 reader, who emailed us yesterday. Stats vary per country, but basically more than 50% of small businesses fail within the first five to f one to five years. Over 66% fail within the first 10 years. That's roughly only 20 to 30% of small businesses make the cut and survive for 10 years and beyond. Can there be assistance or incubators in place wherein these business owners who have survived and made the cut are re recognized and given assistance so that they can proceed to the next level in both the government financing and assistance sector as well as the banking sector? Ms. Mira? I think that over the years there have often been recognitions that the, the, the needs to be, there needs to be more support for small businesses. And there are a number of programs, they're just not very coherent and they're not necessarily very accessible. Um, so, for example, um, the IDC has a small, a small business program. There are, uh, there are other areas where you can access, it's just not that easy. So I, I think there really is room for um, the government to come up with a little bit of a one-stop one shop. They're doing it at the, at the big end of the spectrum, where in the president's office, if you're a big company with issues, you can um, have your um, visa issues for skilled workers, your electricity access, your environmental permits, et cetera, dealt with. And I think we need to come up with something on, on the other end. Um, I mean, for a period of time, we, we even had a ministry that was focusing on small business. Um, now the DTI needs to actually um, step up. I think that's a real role. Because if you look at the statistics, small businesses are what create jobs. We are worried about job losses in the big business area, but small businesses over the course of the last 20 years have been the <coughs> major net creators of jobs in the country. They don't tend to be unionized, so I'm not sure Matthew's going to... Um, well, I'm just picking on him for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have a ministry of small business. Part of the objective of that ministry is to create a very different and much more supportive ecosystem for small businesses and hopefully in time we'll get there, but I think the fragmentation doesn't actually help. Thirdly, uh, I think you can comment on that as well, the structure of our economy is uh, still legacy driven. There's too few small businesses, too few small entrepreneurs, uh, too few entrepreneurs in this country uh, as, a, as a result of our legacy. So all of that needs to uh, change structurally in order to give us the kind of dynamism that uh, small and medium-sized businesses are quite capable of. And part this of that is making it easier mm. for small business to operate. Because the regulatory burden in South Africa for the average business is actually quite high. But what we need to see is the move SARS has started talking about, making it easier for small businesses to deal with taxes, um, making it easier for small businesses to deal with labor law issues. Because if you're one guy and you're a plumber and now you want to employ a few more people, and actually you know that if someone doesn't work out, firing them is going to be impossible, you just don't do it. Mm. 
you want to make it easier for people that employ less than 20 people to operate in this country because that's how we create the jobs we need. Matthew, I can see you want to respond to it, but I will <laughs> ask you to hold your horses for a second. Minister, this question is from Terence Gavender. He wants to know, and this is about skills, which is an absolute key priority of, of the SONA as well. Is there a plan to deal with the lack of skills and expert knowledge and governance at SOE, specifically at ESCOM? Yeah, uh, I think we recognize that there are key areas where there are skills deficits. Uh, part of the state capture project was to actually get rid of honest, skilled people who now find themselves working in the Middle East, in Philippines, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and so on. The, the, the process of slowly attracting some of them back under the new CEO is beginning to happen. And part of that is the skills audit that Ma Matthew was talking about earlier. Have you got the right people in the right job with the right training, and perhaps even the right mentoring in order for them to prosecute the functions that they actually have? And in many instances, we, we uh, I think have been struggling with that for the last 18 months. So if you don't have the right uh, type of engineer or operational person at a power station, then the consequences could be load shedding. Uh, the consequences could be less vigilance in terms of the quality of maintenance that is actually done. And so what you find is maintenance is done today. Uh, the job should actually keep you going for the next six months. Six weeks later, you have a problem. The maintenance company comes back. And that's another form of extraction uh, from, from the, the, the entity. So cleaning up, as I said earlier on, is, is, a, is a tough proposition. And in this area of just maintenance, the quality of work, the rates at which things are charged, uh, the speed with which uh, the work is actually done, and how long it lasts after it is actually done, uh, we've got lots of data on that in the last six weeks or so. And it's, it's f less than adequate at this point in time. Have you got some anecdotes or examples of successes with bringing back people with skills who's gone to Philippines or other countries, engineers? From yeah, I, I don't know the name, but th there's one or two that, that they've already been attracted, and we need to do more at that. But we've got to create the right kind of confidence in our own economy and in our own society. So if we keep asking the negative stuff, who's going to be interested? Everybody wants to leave. Uh, so now it's about staying and building and doing the hard work that will ensure that we get onto the right kind of platform again. I need to wrap up. We've run out of time. It was such an interesting conversation, and we didn't have a proper fight even. And uh, Nazmira, <laughs> can I ask, I'm going to ask each speaker to, to give the closing remarks. Nazmira, if I can start with you. The theme was <coughs> Budget 2020, ESCOM, SA, and the future of South Africa. Um, your thoughts, closing remarks after the budget yesterday on the future of South Africa. I think we find ourselves in a very difficult position at this point in time. But what is heartening to me is this conversation we're having, is the fact that the various um, stakeholders in South Africa are beginning to have the conversation on coming up with a plan we can all support, because that's the only way this works. We can, I can sit here as the private sector and go, oh, we need to cut government wages. But if there's no actual discussion about it, there's no actual progress, which was the case for the last five years, I mean, this was visible years ago. Um, nothing happens. So it feels like we're starting to deal with the hard issues and all the relevant people are in the room at this point in time and part of the conversation. So you disagree fundamentally with some of your colleagues and peers in other organizations who say, take your money and run, get it out of the country as fast as possible. I have been accused of being an optimist. <laughs> I think it's a That's strength, not, worst thing to not be a accused, weakness. <laughs> So um, I, I, th I think, I, well, I'm, I'm certainly here to try and um, rebuild and build for the long term. Matthew Fox? Sure. Look, I mean, I think sometimes we're a bit too hard on ourselves as South Africans. Um, South Africa is a fantastic country with huge opportunities, huge capacity. Um, we've gone through periods of madness, but also periods of brilliance, um, including rugby. But, <laughs> but look, we're at a crossroads. We can... <laughs> Cricket is a funny sport. Um, so we have a choice. We can continue to go down this route and we can watch collapse. We can go the Zimbabwe route or we can get our act together and we can compromise. We can find each other. And that's everything from the tax reform to the fiscus to the economy. The huge opportunities. If we just have the political will, the creativity, the discipline, if we can get off our backsides and do the hard work, we can really ch turn things around significantly. There are some green shoots. But we just have to kind of show the commitment and, and all compromise and contribute, and we can do it. And we've been so 
pleasantly surprised just by some of the comments we received from Bruce of all people who normally demonize us as lunatics, <laughs> but they are willing to contribute to the party and we think we can do it if we're serious about it. Minister? No, there's a uh, great room for optimism despite all the difficulties. Uh, we're going to go through a slightly uh, difficult patch as we have been through before, uh, but we've survived and South Africa is still here, it's still at the southern tip of Africa. and. Uh, if we put uh, all our shoulders to the wheel, we can uh, overcome these difficulties. So it's not easy. It's going to require bold leadership, imaginative leadership, but also generous leadership, where everybody's willing to give and take a little bit and move away from positional play and recognize that the country becomes much more important than any individual or organization at the end of the day. Thank you, Minister Pravin Gordon, Minister of Public Enterprises, Matthew Parks, uh, Parliamentary Coordinator for Kusatu, and Asmira Muller from Investic Asset Management until? Middle of March, soon to be 91. 91, and you will 91. explain to us over coffee why 91. Thank you very much to the viewers uh, who watched Frontline. Uh, lots to talk about. Watch this space. Lots to happen over the next few weeks. We have the business rescue practitioners from SAA. We have an ESCOM dead deal looming. It seems to be a very nice civil conversation, but I'm sure there's fighting behind the scenes that we don't know, but we will try and cover it right here on News24. Thank you for joining us and keep on talking. Thank you.